it's Michelle from Lab Muffin Beauty Science, chemistry PhD, skincare nerd, and not very proud owner of some clogtastic skin. Today we're talking about comedogenicity, or how ingredients make your skin break out. If you like this sort of video, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and make sure you click the notification button so you don't miss out on any of my videos. I'm going to be saying comedogenicity a lot, and it's not an easy word to say, so please forgive me as I butcher it. You've probably seen charts with comedogenic ingredients like this one before. They rate different ingredients on their ability to cause pimples. What you're meant to do is check the ingredients list of your product against this list. If it has highly comedogenic ingredients, it will cause pimples. If it doesn't, then it won't. It's simple, systematic, and foolproof. But is this system actually backed up by science? Comedogenicity is the tendency of an ingredient or product to clog pores. Ingredients are ranked on a scale. Zero means that something is completely non-comedogenic. One means that it's slightly comedogenic. Two to three means it's moderately comedogenic. And four to five means it's going to break you the hell out. The numbers in these scales generally come from studies performed by scientific researchers, and they've been published in peer-reviewed journals. This usually means that they're somewhat reliable and valid. But just like a lot of other claims in skincare that are supported by the research, you don't really see the full story until you dig a bit deeper. So what's wrong with this scale? The problem is that the studies that produce these ratings don't actually reflect what happens when you use these ingredients in skincare products, for a lot of reasons. Firstly, the tests often aren't done in real-world conditions. In an ideal world, we'd test every single product on every single person's face, and then we'd develop a really definitive list of what will and won't break you out. But this would be impossible. It would cost too much, there's way too many products to try on everyone's face, and getting a lot of people to use just one product and not change their daily routine for weeks or months at a time, this would just wouldn't happen. Instead, what's used in a scientific study is a model. A situation that mimics the real world situation, but it's going to be a lot simpler to carry out and control and interpret. There's lots of examples of scientific models, things like crash test dummies, samples of hair that get dyed, pouring liquid onto sanitary pads, patch testing, things on your arm, testing bikes on a racetrack. Most of the time, these models work pretty well, but usually they don't have everything that would happen in real life. So you can't just apply their results really straightforwardly to everyday life. In other words, their external validity can be questionable. When we're talking about comedogenicity ratings, the models aren't that great. The most common test for comedogenicity is the rabbit ear model. This was pioneered in cosmetics testing by two really famous dermatologists, Albert Kligman and James Fulton. This happened in the 1970s. What the rabbit ear model was, was you apply the substance to the inner ear of a rabbit, and then you wait a few weeks and see if you get any clogged pores or comedones. Rabbit ears are a lot more sensitive than human skin, so they react to these ingredients much faster, which was really convenient. The problem is, there's lots of false positives. So ingredients that aren't comedogenic in humans would be in a rabbit ear. In the original test, there was another problem. Rabbit ears have naturally enlarged pores, and some of the earlier results counted these bigger pores as acne, which meant there were even more false positives. So in other words, there were ingredients that people thought were really comedogenic, even though it was just an experimental error. The most famous false positive is petroleum jelly, which is also known as petrolatum, the only ingredient in Vaseline. This false positive was corrected in the late 1980s, but whether or not it was comedogenic was debated until the mid-1990s. This wasn't the first time that the rabbit ear model had problems. There were usually lots of conflicting results, and that's why lots of these comedogenic ingredient lists disagree with each other. More recently, in 2007, two dermatologists wrote, The rabbit ear model is unable to accurately depict the acnegenic potential of chemical compounds, and is therefore only valuable for distinguishing absolute negatives. 
In other words, the rabbit ear model can only tell us about what things are really, really unlikely to cause clogged pores. If rabbit ears don't reflect what happens on human skin, then the obvious solution is to try it on human skin. But again, we got more problems. Firstly, in human skin tests, they usually use the skin on people's backs. The problem is, back skin is different from face skin. So for example, your face skin has a lot more hair follicles, and it's exposed to a lot more sunlight. That means that whether your back and your face react the same way to ingredients is pretty questionable. Human tests also use people with large pores who are more prone to getting pimples. Will someone with small pores react the same way to these ingredients? Most of the time, the way that these tests are conducted is that the ingredient that's being tested is swabbed onto your skin, and then they cover it with a bandage. This isn't typically what you do with skincare. If you cover an ingredient, what happens is you have greater penetration, which means that you're more likely to get pimples. So think about things like when you have clothing rubbing against your skin, this can cause pimples. The human tests are also done on relatively small samples. Usually it's less than 10 people. And so again, there's the problem where it might not be so reliable. You might not get the same result if you test it on 10 other people or on 100 people or 1,000 people. So again, how useful these ratings are, whether we can apply them in our everyday usage of skincare products and cosmetics, it's been pretty overstated. Another huge issue with these comedogenic ingredients is that even if an ingredient is comedogenic on its own, it might not be once you put it into a product. And even if a product doesn't have any comedogenic ingredients, it can still cause pimples when you put it on your skin. There's a saying in biology which is the dose makes the poison. So for example, if you breathe in humid air, it doesn't kill you and it's actually quite nice. But if you breathe in too much water, like in the ocean, then you drown. Drinking one glass of wine is probably fine, but 10 glasses will give you a massive hangover, 50 glasses will probably kill you. So how much you have of an ingredient makes a huge difference to your skin. And clogged pores work this way as well. Here's a quote from a 1996 paper from Kligman. Substances that are strongly comedogenic when tested neat, which means by itself, or in high concentrations become non-comedogenic after sufficient dilution. For example, in a study published in 2006, 100% pure acetylated lanolin alcohol gave a really high comedogenic rating of 4 to 5. At 50%, it was still 4 to 5. But when it was diluted to 25%, it became a rating of 1. Most skincare products contain lots and lots of different ingredients, and most of them are well below 25%. And if they're diluted by that much, they might not have the same effect. So a typical face lotion moisturizer has 80% water which means that all of the other ingredients will max out at 20%, and that's if you only have one other ingredient in your product. The same study also found that products which had notable comedogenic ingredients with 4-5 to five ratings, things like cocoa butter, isopropyl palmitate, and isopropyl isosterate, they didn't actually increase the formation of microcomedones, which are baby pimples. There was also a 1989 paper that found extra combination effects. Ingredients that were mixed together would sometimes be more comedogenic than the single ingredients, and sometimes less. What the ingredient was dissolved in can also make a difference. So here's another quote from Albert Kligman, who pioneered this scale. One cannot determine from a reading of the ingredients whether a given product will be acnogenic or not. What matters solely is the behavior of the product itself. So even the person who invented this scale said flat out that it shouldn't be used to screen an ingredients list. And on top of all of this, there's even more considerations that you should be aware of. Your unique skin chemistry partially tells you whether or not something will be comedogenic or not. Even in the scientific experiments, the same ingredient and the same procedure gave different results on different people. There are lots of reasons this could be the case. You might have different bacteria on your skin, a different skin microbiome, you might have different activity levels, you might get exposed to different environmental conditions, and of course there's always genetics. The source of the ingredient can also change how likely it is that it'll break you out. So for example with natural extracts, there's lots of variation in what chemicals are in particular batches. So all of this means that you can't just check the ingredients list against one of these comedogenic rating lists, and expect that to tell you how acnegenic something is.
So what does all of this mean? It means that these comedogenicity scales are only useful in very limited circumstances. So the first case is narrowing down what might be causing your breakouts. If you're breaking out and you're not sure which product is causing it, then checking for really comedogenic ingredients, like 4 to 5 ratings, high up on an ingredients list might help you look in the right direction. If you have a product and it has no comedogenic ingredients, then it's less likely to be the culprit, but it could still be. So it's important to remember that this is only a starting point and it's not conclusive at all. If your skin is really sensitive to clogging, then it might be worth avoiding products with large amounts of comedogenic ingredients. If you're really acne prone and there's a product which has a bunch of really comedogenic ingredients high up in the list, then it's probably a good idea to avoid the product or patch test it really carefully before you keep using it. If you're already using a product and it's been fine, don't stop using it just because you see that its ingredients match what's high up on this scale. What happens in the real world on your individual skin is much more important than what happens theoretically. Another case where these ratings might actually be useful is if you're trying to avoid undiluted comedogenic ingredients and you don't want to patch test. There are a few ingredients that are commonly used without dilution, so things like natural oils and butters. These ratings can help you navigate these a little bit. Coconut oil, for example, is rated a 4 on this scale, which means it's pretty comedogenic, but lots and lots of people still use it with no problems. If your skin is pretty prone to breakouts, then you might want to patch test it and proceed with caution, or you might want to try a less comedogenic ingredient first. Note that you can't really use the fatty acid profile of an oil to work out how comedogenic the final oil is. The fatty acids are reactive before they're put into the oil, so they don't work the same way. So what you shouldn't do with these ratings lists? You shouldn't go on a witch hunt and chuck out any products that have comedogenic ingredients. You shouldn't avoid a product that otherwise sounds good just because it contains a comedogenic ingredient. You shouldn't bother looking up an ingredient beyond the first five or so, and even five is sort of pushing it or we really dilute by the time it's after the first five ingredients. You also shouldn't use these ratings as a shortcut to avoid patch testing new products. Again, even if it doesn't have comedogenic ingredients, it can still break you out. So that's it for this video, I hope you liked it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. You can also follow me on Instagram and check out my blog if you like beauty science. Leave me a comment letting me know what else you want me to talk about, and see you next time for more beauty science.